Welcome. I'm Dana Brown, and I'm Zojo's Marketing Director. And in this video, we are going to continue with our Programming with Zojo course. If you remember, we left our previous lesson with the first steps on creating classes using an example app, where we started to see the need to save new class instances in order to use them later. For example, it was very uh, probable that we're going to want to access our expense data for other windows apart from this form where we can enter the data in order to create these instances. The collections are really useful for this kind of data storage. So what is a collection data type? In the Zojo language, you can find the array and dictionary as the main collection data structures. The main difference among arrays and dictionaries is that you can think about arrays as a collection with an upper limit or bound where you can access the store data by its index, which is the position such value or data has in the array, while a dictionary has no upper bound. The dictionary uh, is also the data stored via a key value association. That is that you need to use a different and unique key in order to store and retrieve the associated value. In addition, an array can have more than one dimension, acting thus as a kind of matrix. Let's focus on the most basic array with one dimension. Here you can store all kinds of primitive data types as numbers or strings and also references to any class instance. Of course, as it is also the case with any other variable, a given matrix will be able to store only one kind of data type values or instance references. So in order to declare an array variable, as we would do with any other variable, the variable name can be array expenses. And the use of these parentheses are telling us that it is in fact the declaration of an array. Next, we need to tell the data type of the values that can be stored in the array variable. In this case, we want to store expense instances. So we need to type as expense. So this line declares an array expense, array able to store as many expense instances as we need. As you can see here, we didn't set the dimension number, so it only has one dimension by default. If we put a number for our one dimension array, this would set the number of elements or positions pre-initialized in the array, taking into consideration that the first position index is zero. So for example, if it would be an integer array, then the six positions from zero to five would be initialized with the zero value or the nil value for any class data type. And in order to set several dimensions, we can do that with the comma character. So here we are setting an array with three dimensions with a range from zero to five, zero to 10, and zero to 10 for each one of the three. So we can store and access values from zero, zero, zero to five, 10, 10. For now, let's continue with its more basic form. Once we declared our array variable, we can start storing our expense instance references into it. So once we create every new expense instance, we can store the data into the new object properties. We can add the new instance to the array expense variable using this line of code, array expenses dot add row, new expense. If we execute our example app at this point, we can see how these new instances are added into the array. Let's type any date and other required data in order to create new expense instances. And let's set a breakpoint right here. So if we click on the add button, we will be brought back to, into the debugger in the IDE. 
and it will pause the execution in the line with the breakpoint. As you can see under the variables panel, array expenses has a negative one index because it is empty after the declaration and no value has been stored yet, as we can see if we click on it. But as soon as we execute the next line of code, the new expense instance is stored in our array, and this is reflected in the debugger panel. In fact, when we click in the object stored in the array, we can access the new values stored by that expense instance. But this array will be destroyed, meaning emptied from memory, as soon as it's executed in the last line of code in the event handler. If you remember from previous chapters, the array will be created when the event handler is entered and that line of code is executed. But once we reach the last line, all the variables will be deleted from memory and thus their stored values. This isn't very useful if we want our expense value values to be accessed from other sections in our app. So how can we improve the stored data persistence along the app? Very simple. As we did with our expense class definition where we added the properties in order to store the data, we can also do the same with the other objects in our app, as, for example, the by default window and the app object itself. So let's try to add a new property to the window one window, using for that the option available under the contextual menu and using the associated inspector panel for its declaration, as we do when declaring regular variables. In this case, we need to type array expense as the name, expense as the data type, and don't forget to add the parentheses in order to convert it from a regular property to an array property. For now, let's keep the scope as private. In brief, the scope tells the compiler which objects can access the property, so keeping it private means that the only code that can access it is from the window one itself. Now we can delete the array expense declaration from the event handler. We can modify the array name for the new one, and if we execute our app again, we can test how it works now. So let's type a date and other required data. And when we click on the add button, we'll jump into the debugger window where we can see that now the array expense array is found under the self object, that is the window executing this fragment of code. And if we click on the window one dot window one entry, we can access all of the properties for that object being one of these are expense, array expense array, where it will store the new expense instance objects. If we click in the array expense entry, we can see that it is empty before executing this line of code, but it will add the new references as soon as we execute that line in the debugger. If we continue with the app execution, adding a second object, the code execution is paused in the breakpoint. And as soon as we execute that one, we will see we'll be able to see how that second instance is added to the array expense property under the window. And in fact, we can see the two added objects and access their stored values. Now, when the last line of code is executed, we will still have to access our array, improving its persistence. When would this array be destroyed or deleted from memory? As soon as we close the window where the property belongs. We can test this adding the close event handler with the break sentence. So we need to restart our app. We add the first expense instance, the second one, and if we close the window now, we reach the break sentence where we can see how the expense array is still available. But as soon as the app exits the execution of the close event handler, then all of their objects will be destroyed, including the array and also its stored values, in this case, objects. So if we wanna keep our array values even longer, 
we can simply move our property from the window one window to the app object. This way it will be kept in memory until we exit from the app itself. And in addition, it can be accessed by any other window that we may want to create and use in our app. The only thing we need to do in this case is changing its scope from private to public. What this means is that any object from any class will be able to access this property under the app object. And in the code we are using for this example, we only need to prefix the property name with the name of the object it belongs to, in this case, app. So if we execute the app again, typing once again new values in order to create expense instances, so it's added to the array expense under the app object, as we can see, clicking on globals and the app object in order to reach the array expense property where the new instance is stored. Let's add a second object to the array. And if we close the window now, executing the break line and pausing the next execution from the debugger toolbar, we can see how in this case, the app object still keeps the references to our added expense object. What are some of the methods provided by an array? As you can see yourself when using the auto completion feature of the IDE, if we type this uh, array.app expense and press the tab key, we can access some of the applicable methods as the ones we're being used or add row at in order to add an object into the specified index value. So if we want to add a new value in the first array position, we should use zero as the index value, and then the name of the variable whose value we want to store. Here, it's new expense. We can also know the amount of the items stored in the array using count, or if we know the last index position in the array, calling it the last row index method. We can also resize the array, remove any of the stored entries at a given position or index, all the entries, and even shuffle the entries, something especially interesting when the array deal deals with a number of values. In the next video, we will see how to use the dictionary collection in addition to improving our expense class with new capabilities and features. As usual, I hope you have found this one useful, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you want more information about Zojo, please check out our blog.